Okay. Um, good morning. Welcome. Thank you for joining in. Can you connect to the audio? Check. Headphones or speakers? Okay. Check. Uh, okay. Can those online hear me? Check. Can you? Okay. Uh, thanks for joining uh, once again. Um, volume is very low. Check, check. Is it still low? Okay. All right, yeah, cool, thank you. Uh, please bear with me, I have a little bit of a sore throat. Okay, let's continue. Sorry about the delay in the start, some technical difficulties. Okay, uh, we'll start with chapter 13, uh, the local church where we uh, we ended with chapter 12 in the previous class, um, the bride. We looked at three different facets of the church last class. Uh, let's continue where we left off. We'll start with chapter 13. The local church, a house of prayer and worship. Okay. Um, so uh, you would have heard me say this time and time again. From, uh, there's this one recurring theme in the Bible uh, that God keeps saying from Genesis to Revelation. What is that? You've heard me say this many times from praise and worship class. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> There's one recurring theme. Okay. God loves people, He chases them. Okay. So from Genesis to Revelation, uh, there's in many different ways, he says the one thing. But most of the books, he literally says something. He, time and time again, we see him saying in the Bible, I will be your God. Thank you for finishing that. Right? I will be your God, you will be my people. I will be your God, you will be my people. And there are times where he says, you will be my people and I will be your God. That is that is the recurring theme of the Bible and all the different books that you see from Genesis to Revelation, 66 different books across time, thousands of years. That is a recurring theme. Uh, the heart of God is that he wants to have a people that where among whom he can dwell. That's it. That's the heart of God. He wants to find a people that he can dwell among them. Okay, that is the recurring theme of God. And uh, and so we see, you know, Genesis chapter 3, verse 8, um, Adam and Eve sinned. They hid themselves from the presence of God, it says. Isn't it? Uh, Genesis chapter 3, verse 8, that's what it says. They hid. The very important word there is H-I-D hid simply because simply means that because of sin they separated they were they were separated from the presence of god yes that's what the basic definition of sin if anyone asks you is separation from his presence and a separation from his presence simply means death okay now what happens when our spirit is separated from our physical body the physical body just drops dead 
isn't it? That's death, isn't it? It's big, why? Because the spirit has been separated from what it was supposed to be connected to, right? Um, and so similarly, God walked with Adam and Eve in the cool of the garden. They were with them. They had fellowship. They had communion. And that's what we were. Romans chapter 3, verse 23, it says, All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Yeah, God's glory, glory of God. That means there is a mark. Have you, have you played the dart game? I mean, you get these magnetic ones, right? So whoever throws closer, the highest points and all, right? So that's, there's a mark. Another bow and arrow, archery, this, they call it the bullseye, right? right? That's the mark. So the far, further away you are from the mark or the bullseye, that means you are short. You are falling short of that mark. Is it? Our mark was the glory of God. Our mark was the glory of God. We were designed in, with the intention to dwell in His glory. But what sin did? We, it separated us, right? Um, and it's a, it's a very painful thing. That means, in other words, we were dead in our sins, Ephesians 2 says. We were dead in our transgressions, in our sins. In other words, we were separated from His presence. That was, but God's heart was always, has always been that, that He will have a people that whom, among whom He will dwell, among whom He will fellowship and have a communion with. So the fall happened, and uh, 2,500 years later, God, through Moses, instructs uh, to build a sanctuary. Right? Uh, sorry, again, I keep sounding very redundant, but 2,500 years, uh, nobody felt the need to go after his presence. Think of everything that has happened in 2,500 years, from Genesis chapter 3 to Exodus 25. The story of Noah and his sons, and then Jacob, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and uh, and Leah and Rachel. Let's throw them into the mix. Joseph, Tamar, and Judah. Uh, you know, all of this thing has happened. Is the Lord has happened in the 2,500 years, and you, time and time again, you see that there were visitations of God. His hand was on him. Right, God visited. Uh, he would Christophany. Uh, or a theophany is a theological word, uh, is the manifestation of God. Okay, Christophany is a pre incarnate manifestation of Christ. Christophany it simply means it's a pre incarnate manifestation of Christ. That's what Christophany is. Okay, so there's another word in parallel synonym to that is theophany. It simply means a manifestation of God. Okay, so when uh, he manifested himself to uh, Abraham, you know, and uh, so we see that Christophany happening in Joshua chapter 5, when he appears to Joshua as the captain of the Lord's armies, he says, isn't it? So that's Christophany. Uh, so that we see time and time again, there was a lot of visitations of God, but there was no dwelling place. There was no place like the Garden of Eden. Uh, we're not talking about the tabernacle, so uh, we will talk a little bit, but uh, I'm not going to dwell too much about it. But the reason I'm saying all of this is we come to Exodus chapter 19. Exodus chapter 19 is a very crucial chapter, which again, uh, we get to read about the heart of God in the book of Exodus itself. There's a lot of things that's happening in Exodus. As soon as you think of Exodus, you only think of one thing, people coming out of uh, Egypt, bondage, you know, and then, you know, Red Sea being parted, all of that. You don't even think about all the other plagues or other miracles. Is it people coming out of Egypt, Red Sea parted, story over, Exodus is done. Uh, but let's see from Exodus 19, verse 3 to 6, in the notes it says, And Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians. So God is telling Moses to tell the people of Israel, you have seen. That means people have seen, right? They saw what God did to Egyptians. And how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Okay, it's a very important word there. I didn't bring you out for the sake of bringing you out. I didn't bring you out so that you can just run wild 
and have and have sexual immorality and commit sin and uh, idolatry, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I brought you out to myself. In other words, what is he saying? Okay, let's let's just continue reading. Now, therefore, okay, why is it therefore? Okay, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. Okay, so see how beautiful it is. From verse 5, Pasi says, I'm bringing you out to myself. That means I'm setting you apart to myself. And so therefore, if you obey me, if you keep, if you obey my voice, keep my commandments, then you will be a special treasure to me above all people. Um, another translation, this is NKJV, I think, but uh, other translations are also very nice in terms it says that among all the other people of the earth, although the whole earth is mine, among all the other nations, you will be my treasured possession. And then verse 6, and so you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Very important to note that God's original desire, intention was for the whole nation of Israel to be priests. Not only the tribe of Levites. Isn't it? It is unless, uh, until in Exodus chapter 32 verse 6, where, uh, you know, they've sinned, they've built a golden calf, they've sinned uh, when Moses was up in the mountains for 40 days, 40 nights. Uh, and then he comes down, he throws the tablets and, you know, major scene happens. And Moses, in a very dramatic and a very cinematic way, he stands up and says, who's on the Lord's side shall come this side, you know? And uh, that's in, I, I think, Exodus 32, 6. And then it says only the Levites ran to the other side. And so that was like the beginning of the tribe of Levites being, the, you know, getting into the role of priesthood. But God's original desire was what? That the whole nation of Israel, that means all 12 tribes of Israel, to be the priesthood. Are you guys with me? So what was not achieved in the Old Testament, Jesus, through his blood and his sacrifice and what he paid, has made us royal priests. And it is with that revelation that Peter writes in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, You also, a living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, the house of God or the local church. A holy priesthood. It's not just talking about an individual. When God spoke about you know, the holy nation and a priesthood in Exodus 19, he was talking as a collective. Isn't it? It's the same thing here. Is that you and I, we are called to be this priesthood. We come under the priesthood. Yeah? Uh, and so... Is, It, I just started studying on the priesthood, the importance of it, and why we are all called to be a royal priesthood. Uh, but we're not going to go deep into that because we don't have. We, we might end up just talking only about that. So, uh, as a royal, as a holy priesthood, we are called to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Um, so, that last ending of that verse is very important. We are called to offer up spiritual sacrifices. Acceptable to God through whom? Through Jesus. So anything that is, any sacrifice that is done outside of Jesus Christ is false worship. Simple as that. Anything that is outside of Jesus that is not done through him, in and through him is false worship. Are you with me, right? So it is through Jesus Christ. Why? Because he is the one, he is the ultimate sacrifice. Uh, Hebrews chapter nine and verse Hebrews chapter nine and chapter ten says, Jesus, once and for all, not through the blood of goat and calves, but through by His own blood, entered the holy of holies. It's amazing what He did. Jesus was not only the offering; He was also the offerer. He was not just the sacrifice, but He was also the high priest. <laughs> You're right, Prince. You're right. <laughs> you're right. You're right. 
are, are you with me right um so and jesus and only jesus can do that but you see the heart of god here isn't it that you and i are called to be priests um ladies too <laughs> okay so some of the responsibilities of priests uh this is a wonderful chapter well, let's um let's see Okay, uh, Leviticus chapter 6, verse 12 and 13. One of the responsibilities of a priest was to keep the fire going. Okay, Leviticus chapter 6, verse 12 and 13. It says, uh, this is again the instruction. Um, okay, how many of your favorite book is Leviticus? Exactly, all right? They're like, oh yeah, pastor, my favorite book is Leviticus, you know? You know, sometimes we get excited about reading the whole Bible and, you know, we start saying, okay, I'm going to read the whole Bible. Let's start, I'm going to start from Genesis, Genesis and Exodus. Well, okay. Yeah. And then Leviticus. All right. Okay. What's happening now? As if that was not enough numbers. All right. Yeah. A lot of zeros there, you know. This one had so many sons, that one had so many sons. What, what exactly is happening? You know, one of the most uh, funniest thing about the book of Numbers, uh, its original name in the Hebrew, it's uh, Bamid Bar. It means in the wilderness. That's what it literally means. How in the wilderness became Numbers, I have no idea. <laughs> right? Yeah. So anyways. So God is instructing that one of the responsibilities of a priest is to keep the fire burning, okay? But it is the Lord's responsibility to send the fire. You see that in Leviticus chapter 9, verse 24. The first fire came from heaven, then, yeah. <laughs> so God sends the fire. God will pour out His Spirit on all flesh. Whose responsibility it is to keep the fire going? Yeah. Us. Not just the pastor's responsibility. Say an amen. amen. Uh, <laughs> they have one pastor in the room, I guess. Though. <laughs> what, guys? <laughs> Are you with me? Um, right. So there's this wonderful book by Leonard uh, or Leonard Ravenhill called Why Revival Tarries. Uh, it's a beautiful book. Uh, you should read that when you, if you can. Okay, so God is very clearly instructing Moses, okay, you set up the tabernacle, prepare the altar, everything, uh, and I will send the fire. Your job is to keep the fire burning. Morning and evening, morning and evening, morning and evening. Okay, um, so fire falls on the sacrifice, we provide the sacrifice, and God provides his fire. Romans chapter 12, verse 1, uh, what does it say? Therefore, I beseech you, brethren, Offer yourselves up as, as a living sacrifice, right? So what Paul is saying is that, I mean, again, it's just a wonderful verse. I beseech you. That means it's a fancy word of saying, I'm begging you. All right, Paul, uh, in whom today's day and age, like I said, historians consider that he had at least 20 PhDs. Uh, Paul is saying that, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, why by the mercies of God? Because the first 11 chapters of the book of Romans, he's only talking about the mercy of God. And then he's, he's, given, he's given a huge 11 chapter introduction of the mercies of God. And then he finally talks about the mercies of God. Offer yourself because of his mercy. Because of his mercy, uh, which I've explained to you in these 11 chapters, uh, offer yourself up as living sacrifices, right? But you see, in the priesthood, we are priests, isn't it? Now, priests had to build an altar. They had to provide the sacrifice. Then the fire came. So what Paul is saying, in other words, what God is saying through Paul, in, is that it's not enough that you just, now, in the new covenant, it's not enough that you just build your altar. You also have to be on the altar that you build. By doing that, because you're also you know, performing the duties of a priesthood. <laughs> okay, that's one responsibility, perpetual fire. Um, <clears throat> all right, next one, the holy incense. You guys doing all right? Okay, Rin? Yes. So you're not only, we're not just called now in the new covenant to just build the altar. 
because in the old covenant what happened is they built the altar someone else gave the offering right and by the time the offering is actually laid on the altar it's dead but now we are priesthood we have the responsibilities to build the altar and offer yourself up as living sacrifices to live a life <laughs> Yeah, oh yeah, sure. I un yeah, I see you understood that. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <clears throat> In order to the fire to be there, yeah. uh, there should be a sacrifice. Yes. If there's no sacrifice, why will the fire come? In order for God, fire and all this, not to be the sacrifice. Sacrifice, yeah. See. <clears throat> it's saying you're being obedient and offering your body, your life, in other words, as so that he can fall on you. See, there's again parallel from say Second Samuel chapter six, defining chapter. What happens? David goes to bring the Ark of the Covenant for the first time to, to Jerusalem. Right? First time what he does, he fails miserably. Why? They place the Ark of the Covenant on the bullock cart. Who is supposed to carry the Ark of the Covenant? Levites, who are human beings. Isn't it? Yes or no? So humans were supposed to carry the presence of God, not something else. You and I were designed to carry his presence. That is why Joel says that he will pour out his spirit on all bullock carts. Oh. Understood? So. That means we are the sacrifice. You offer yourself up. He'll follow you. Say, Lord, fill me. Fill me with your fire. You see, all those prayers are birthed from there. Just fill me with your fire. What is that? Fall down. Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 18, he dug a deep thing and then he filled it with water and then he built an altar. And then the sacrifice. So there was a lot of preparation that went into that until uh, unless the fire came down. <clears throat> You're with me, right? Okay. All right, let's move on. Another responsibility um, that the priesthood performed was um, one of the pieces of furniture in the holy place, not the holy of holies. In the holy place, there were three pieces of furniture. What are they? So as you enter the holy place, to your right will be the table of showbread. There will be 12 loaves of bread that will be kept. That symbolize the 12 tribes of Israel. On the left was the golden lamp stand, right? With seven lamps uh, burning. And they had to make sure that fire was burning continuously as well. Okay, And that piece of lamp stand was made up of with one piece of gold. Uh, and it would be in the and it would have the design of almond trees and branches in it. So that symbolized almond. Yeah. It's so why almond tree okay, history, but let's, no mate, let's go on. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and then the close another piece of furniture near the veil in the holy place was the altar of incense. Okay, and so that incense. Uh, okay, actually, let's just read this. Exodus 30, verse 34 to 38. It says, And the Lord said to Moses. Take sweet spices, stacte, and onyxia, and galbanum, and pure frankincense with these sweet spices. There shall be equal amounts of each. What's happening is God is giving ingredients, the actual recipe <laughs> of what needs to go into making this holy incense. He just didn't say, okay, you know, all these spices that are available in your region, because you are in the Mediterranean region, you know, you'll have all these wonderful spices. Just use any of those, whatever you want. No. He's giving, <laughs> you know, detail. Okay, one teaspoon of this, one teaspoon of that, you know, in equal portions. That's what he's saying, isn't it? Verse 35, you shall make uh, of these an incense, a compound according to the art of the perfumer, salted, pure, and holy. It gets more interesting. And you shall beat some of it very fine and put some of it before the testimony in the, ta in the tabernacle of meeting, where I will meet with you. 
it shall be most holy to you. What shall be? The, that incense. Why? That, holy again is what, guys? The root meaning? Set apart. That means cut. Set apart. We Again, we have to be very careful when we're using those words. Set apart. Because we tend to, any words that we tend to overuse it, we become too familiar with it. And when we become over familiar with it, what happens? It loses its significance. Like John 3 16. Okay. God's all of the world that he gives only begotten son, that all of all of the world, you know. <laughs> like, but the weight and the significance of that verse saved mankind, showed us who the Father is. Isn't it? Okay, I've just deviated a little bit, but in English, we think, okay, for God so love the world. Like, you know, SMS text, message language, one S with some 10,000 O's. I love you so much. I hate you so much, you know. But in the Greek, in the language that it was written, it simply says, is, God loved the world, so he gave his son. One displacement of the word. It changes the whole meaning of it. And so when we say set apart, set apart, set apart, you have to be so careful. It's like you take something special that belongs to you and you set it apart. In a simple ex uh, example, I've ha I have a lot of friends, you know, if they like something that they that's on their plate, you know, you'll always have something on your plate that you like. Yeah, some, like your favorite. There are two kinds of people. One who will eat that first or the other who will keep that favorite and the most to the last, what they're doing, they're setting that apart, <laughs> right? You take it, you take the most, your most precious thing that belongs to you, you set it apart. You don't use it for anything else. We will all have that one shirt, you will only wear it for that wedding. It's like, this is the wedding shirt. No matter which wedding I go, how many times I go, this shirt is set apart until the Lord provides me with another. I think only boys can relate to that, but yeah. <laughs> okay, so you get the idea of it, isn't it? So God is saying, this incense is to be set apart. Why he's very serious about it in the next verse. He's saying, but as for the incense which you shall make, you shall not make any for yourself. According to its composition. It shall be holy to you. Ho uh, it shall be to you holy for the Lord. Set apart for the Lord. Whoever makes any like it to smell it, he shall be cut off. A different version of set apart from his people. Are you with me? Right. No, holy incense, uh, and we see that in Revelation chapter 8, verse 4, there was a bowl of incense, it goes on to say, which were the prayers of the saints. Revelation chapter 8, verse 4, maybe we'll read it a little later. But it simply represented intercession. Another responsibility and the duty of a priest is to constantly offer up prayer, continually pray, or pray without ceasing. Okay, the duties of a priesthood is, I'm not going to say it's easy or simple. It can be challenging, uh, but it's wonderful. It's an absolute honor to be the, you know, God's priest. The priest was a bridge, was a representative of between heaven and earth, like a mediator. Jesus is our high priest, the Hebrew says. He's, he's right now interceding for us. We recently did a prayer, a, a series on prayer, right? Following Jesus in prayer. Pastor Ashish did that. And he talks about how Jesus is the high priest and he's still interceding for us. Right? And so one of the duties of uh, a priest is to, off is to constantly offer up prayer, isn't it? It's we are in the chapter, if you've forgotten, that the house of God shall be a house of prayer and worship right <clears throat> and so anything that we do unto him it shall be separated and kept as holy are you all with me yes following okay so fast forward uh from exodus 
and about a thousand years later approximately uh, this is person called david who comes into the picture the shepherd boy uh, we see that he's first being introduced in exodus sorry first samuel chapter 6 16 i think 16 i think and so where uh, god rejects saul as the king and it's very interesting that god tells samuel uh, that i have chosen a man after my own heart God says, I have chosen for me a man after my own heart while David was still a boy. Some of you are like, okay, what's the big deal? <laughs> Only God, you know, can look into us and see that there's a king in us, in each one of us, and call out the destiny that he has in place for us. Right For everybody else, he was just the youngest, useless, worthless, uh, maybe a brat, a shepherd boy, sent away to just take care of the sheep, uh, not regarded, not liked by his uh, brothers. But God tells him, okay, um, I have chosen for me a man after my own heart, and he will lead his people. Right? Um, why did David... Why was David able to kill a Goliath in public? Because he could kill a lion and a bear in private. So when we learn to conquer our bears and our lions in private, he will use you to kill a Goliath in public where everybody can see. Once you build a lifestyle of prayer and worship in the secret place. See, David was a shepherd boy, isn't it? Now, in their culture, a shepherd, if he took a flock and went away, he's all by himself for at least, I'm saying, minimum of 12 hours. He's gone into the wilderness. Eight hours, 12 hours, it could go on. Sometimes they'll be all night during the rough seasons when there is no green pastures. Uh, they'll have to go far away. Right? So what does he do when he's all by himself? He's taking care of the flock, yes. He has his guitar, harp. He's just worshipping, writing songs. Kill a lion and a bear like it's a puppy. Or, you know. You know, David, the way he narrates the story to Saul, he says, how can you kill this giant? David says, like, Lord, when a bear or when a lion attacked me, I held the lion by its beard. That's what the Bible says. Now, how close do you have to be a whole lion by its beard? Arms distance. Wow. And so David, to say the least, was very passionate about everything that he did in life. <laughs> he was very passionate. And, and I, I don't really like the word passion because it can be very deceiving. But then uh, when, when you get to the root of it, it, everything that he did, he was very expressive. He was very passionate uh, about it. And so, fast, uh, long story. I'm, I'm making the long story longer. <laughs> right. So David comes into the scene. He's anointed by Samuel. In ex uh, I keep saying Exodus. <laughs> Samuel chapter 16. But it is not until, say, 13 or 14 years that David goes through this period of wilderness where Saul is chasing him. He's trying to be, you know, he's... Uh, it's just an incredible story. Saul wants to kill him. Uh, his own people abandon him. And then later, his own people want to kill him. David is even rejected by his enemy. Now, you know you're having a very bad day when your own enemy wants to reject you. He's like, please, I don't want anything to do with you. Please, I don't want to be your enemy also. Just go away. David had a very rough life. Now, from the time he was anointed by Samuel to the time he actually got the throne. That's about 13, 14 years. He was molded. And when he came to power, when he finally got the throne, one of the first things that he does, does is he brings the ark back. He pitches a tent, which is later known as the Tabernacle of David, upon a hill. He pitched it. And the people that were set the administrative uh, with the administrative responsibilities were incredible. Four thousand gatekeepers. 
<laughs> I'm trying to wrap my head. See, I've thought about this chapter and I and every time I say this, it stumps me. It absolutely stumps me. I'm like, like Lord, just give me a vision of how it would have looked like. You know, what 4,000 gatekeepers? And so he he organized, he administered a way of worship where it was never seen before in Israel. What David was what we will call in this day and age as a say a trailblazer, is someone who sets the trend. If David had a brand, it would be a brand called Presence. Are you with me? And so, so twenty four seven worship that happened, he which he initiated. It went on for any idea how many years? Thirty three years. Okay, just remember these. It's yeah, it's not a history exam or anything, but then it's very important because 33 years, same duration of the life of Jesus. Right? And so what he did was so powerful that kings who came after him followed in what is known as the Davidic order of worship. Davidic order of worship, yeah. And we will learn in depth from First Chronicles chapter 25 next year when we do worship ministry. Wait, y'all are in second years, right? Okay. <laughs> uh, but yeah, the the what he said was absolutely, uh, you know, beautiful. Um, there was order in what he did. He just didn't say, okay, you know, he he chose the Levites. Among the Levites, he has, you know, Jerithan, Heman, uh, and uh, who was Asaph, and then his sons, sons of Asaph, sons of Heman, sons of Jerithan. Uh, they were all rostered. We have a roster, right? They were rostered uh, accordingly. And so there was systems in place. It was not like, okay, we pitched that tent now. Okay, let's, go, let's do whatever you want to do. No. Pretty much like what we try to accomplish in this day and age, isn't it? We have roster. We have systems. Okay, today you will lead worship. Tomorrow you will lead worship. Today, you, you know, these people will be a band, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So that went on for 33 years. Um, and yeah, First Chronicles 25 is a wonderful, wonderful chapter, which we will uh, again learn. And so we see that the Davidic order of worship was followed by his son Solomon, which later became the temple, right? The temple that Solomon builds, which was just extravagant, beautiful temple, uh, which was again destroyed later by the Babylonians. The first temple was destroyed by the Babylonians and Israel has been taken into exile for 70 odd years. That's where the story of Nehemiah, Ezra, and Daniel takes place, right? So his son followed the Davidic order of worship. Another king who came after that called Jehoshaphat, Joash, uh, Hezekiah, Josiah. And, you know, they were all followed this Davidic order of worship. As if that was not enough, about 200 odd years later, where Ezra and Nehemiah come into the picture, Ezra and Nehemiah doesn't happen immediately after the life of you know Josiah. There's a two hundred years gap there. Two hundred years later, they're still following the Davidic order of worship. Come on. I leave APC as a worship pastor role, and I go away somewhere. They'll forget what what I set up in one week. <laughs> I'm. We're just talking about this as to. How incredible it must have been to impact generations. Our God is a God of generations, isn't it? In the old in old covenant, he always people always knew him as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It symbolized generations. Anytime God blesses, it would be for the generations to come. There's so many examples in the Bible about that. He's the God of generations. He's not just concerned about you. He's concerned about the lineage that comes out of you. And the devil knows that. That's why he wants to steal, kill, and destroy you. One, yes, he's afraid of what you can do. And then he's afraid of everything what your lineage can do to his kingdom. Are you with me, right? You guys following? Okay. 
And I hope you what, what you carry. Uh, I hope you realize what you carry is very powerful, and what God has called you for is very powerful. It's not. It's not just to play church. It's not just to play church. Jesus didn't die on a cross and ro uh, rose again so that you and I can have a dress code or create n number of denominations or our own understanding of principles. And we say, no, this is right worship. That is not the right worship. Why are you worshiping like that? Then you should worship like that. You think Jesus died for that so that we can play church? So that you and I can have a dress code? We've reduced what Jesus has done to all those things. We've reduced the responsibility, the objective, the purpose, and the destiny of a church to all these small, trivial things. When we are called to impact generations. You're following, right? Okay. Um, so again, 100, 100 years later, 250 years later, Amos prophesies, uh, God is saying, on that day, Amos chapter 9, verse 11 to 13, uh, we all know this scripture. We've at least heard of it. Amos chapter 9, verse 11 to 13, it says, On that day I will raise up the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. Now, we only remember the first half of that line. On that day I will raise up the tabernacle of David. Stop. We think there's a full stop after that. I will raise up the tabernacle of David, comma. Why? Because which has fallen down. And we see that James, later on in the book of Acts, he quotes from Amos. Now let's just read that scripture just a little bit. Uh, and repair its damages, I will raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old, uh, that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the Gentiles who are called by my name. Okay, then they may possess the remnant of Edom. Edom represented the Philistines. Edom were the Gentiles. Okay, and you see when Goliath is introduced later on, it says Goliath the Edomite. Most of the times in the Bible, when the character or a very important or a significant character is introduced for the first time, it will usually say where that person is from. It's like uh, saying, uh, you know, like Prince, the Josephite, you know, Rin from the Christite. <laughs> you know, like, so, <clears throat> and why is that saying over there? That they may possess the remnant, possess, that means take over, take charge, be in control of Edom and all the Gentiles who are called by my name. says the Lord who does this thing. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when the plowman shall overtake the reaper and the trader of grapes, him who sows seed. The mountains shall drip with sweet wine, and all the hills shall flow with it. Uh, the, that verse is the consequential thing of what happens when God overtakes, when he's rebuilding the tabernacle of uh, praise and worship. Okay, are you all with me? All okay? Nickel? It's fine. Okay. Right, so we see that uh, verse being quoted again in Acts chapter 15, verse six, 16 and 17. Uh, it says, after this, this is James quoting, okay, from Amos. After this, I will return and rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I will rebuild its ruins and I will set it up so that the rest of the mankind may seek the Lord. Even all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who does all these things. So the church, which is called to be the house of prayer and worship, is to be a place where it's, it's a blessing to all the nations. It's very simple, isn't it? We are not just called to cater to the Christian community. Yeah, that's what a house of prayer and worship does. Um, okay, let's want to take a break now, and then we can continue maybe because there's quite a bit of verses that we need to cover. 
So let's just pause here and uh, I will resume in the next session, okay? Thank you.